let's get started, folks. My name's Dr. Mike Sussel. I'm a large animal surgeon up in Prescott. Um, for those of you guys that I don't know, uh, I've been out here for, I joined Prescott Animal Hospital in 2014. Um, and as of January of this year, I've been working as the tech, full-time technical vet for Anacel. It's based down in Chandler. Um, I got into Anacel using their, their product. Um, one of the attendees tonight is Mr. Brandon Ames. He's our CEO. Uh, Brandon came and visited me and presented the product to me. Uh, I can remember in vet school, one of my mentors used an amniotic material to heal wounds. So I did have somewhat of a, a background in it. Uh, and, and I really liked the product. And, and one of the things that Brandon and I talked about way back then was to me to have a, a good product, a new product on the market, you, you want to meet really three main criteria. Number one, it's got to work. Um, number two, it's got to be cost effective. Uh, and number three, it needs to be really user friendly. If it's too complicated to use, most people aren't going to use it. Um, and through clinical practice and treating cases, I, I really found that, that Anacel did meet all of, all of the criteria that I personally had. Um, and I was really excited a, about the successes that I had treating various superficial and internal wounds um, and, and eventually ended up joining the company. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. For anybody that, that joined after I made the comment earlier, uh, as long as your microphone's not muted, if you have a question, just say, hang on, stop a minute, I've got a question, and, and we'll go over it. So, you know, I want everything to, to kind of be a, a nice interactive session here. Uh, so, we'll, we'll get started. Um, Anacel is, is uh, a wound healing company, a biotech company that what we do is we utilize the amnion uh, to, to heal both superficial and, and internal wounds. We utilize both the, the membrane and the liquid as a regenerative therapy. And one of the great things about the amnion is not only has it been around, the, the, first, the first peer reviewed literature in the human world was published in 1910. So this is not it's not a new therapy. Uh, Amnion's been around for a long time. It fell out of favor for a while on the human side, uh, especially when HIV was, was first discovered uh, because of the fears of contamination. Um, you know, but it, it's come back really since about the mid 90s on the human side, and, and we've been using it for quite a few years oh, probably 20 plus in veterinary medicine easily. One of the downsides to it was always you had to collect the amnion, clean it, and keep it stored in a freezer. Uh, so it could be a little bit cumbersome. Some of the real benefits to amnion is amnion, uh, like only a few other tissues in the body, is an immune privilege site. So we don't see reactions to, to the tissue. Uh, the mesenchymal and epithelial stem cells that are present in the fluid are MHC class two negative. So you don't have reactions to the cells. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to it. You know, amnion from what I remember in vet school was something that kind of got skipped over. We didn't talk about it a whole lot in repro class. It was just one of the fetal tissues. But when you really look at the physiology of it, the amnion and the, and the fluid surrounding the fetus is actually incorporated into that tissue growth. Uh, so it truly is a tissue that is designed to grow tissue. Uh, and it's responsible for a good portion of, of fetal development uh, during the birthing process or during fetal maturation. We kind of like to say in Anacel that it's human tested animal approved simply because of the history on, in human medicine. Again, it dates back to 1910 
And, and that was for burn victims, superficial wounds, and, and corneal injuries. Uh, so there, there really is a lot of science behind it. From a regenerative standpoint, one of the things that, that I always look at in regenerative therapy is there's essentially three key components to regenerative therapies or, or three subsections of material that, that you can draw from. You can have a cellular product, you can have just growth factors, uh, or you can have just an extracellular matrix. You know, and we're all familiar with stem cells having a straightforward growth factor product. There's not many of those available commercially. That's more of a research thing. Um, but then the extracellular matrices, uh, an excellent example of that was that old product A cell that used to be out uh, on the market. A lot of vets would use it for corneal injury. It was used in the human human world for rotator cuff repair, uh, but that was an acellular matrix uh, that, that was a, a extracellular matrix. Like most things though, when, when we think about these three different components, if you can draw all three of them together, or at least two of the three, you're gonna get a better effect than, than using a single one by itself. And, and Amnion gives us the ability to do all three of them or the growth factor and extracellular matrix in our acellular products. And some of the things that have been shown on the human side about amniotic material, is there's actually a lot of work that shows that amniotic material has an antimicrobial effect, that it does repress bacterial growth. It has a lot of anti-inflammatory components to it. We'll, I'll show you some of those here in just a minute. It has anti-fibrotic and anti-adhesive properties to it. And in the, the human literature, there's actually been some work done looking at anti-tumorigenic effects. I was just looking at some of those on PubMed this morning. Uh, there's not anything right now in the veterinary literature uh, but there's some really nice work in the human literature, and, and it may be something that we eventually move into in the veterinary literature. It's actually treating tumors with amniotic material. This is just a picture of the stem cells. Again, uh, amniotic material contains both mesenchymal and epithelial stem cells. Um, these are not totipotent cells that, that would be fetal derived. They're a pluripotent cell from a newborn. Uh, but it's both mesenchymal and epithelial, which becomes important because it allows for more differentiation in, in tissue lines, depending on what you're treating. One of the other things that's important when you think about stem cells, as a large animal surgeon, I've used a lot of fat derived, I've used a lot of bone marrow derived, um, but as an animal ages, the concentration of stem cells uh, when you take bone marrow or collect fat decreases. The, early, the, the younger the animal is, the easier it is to collect stem cells. Additionally, the more potent those stem cells become. Aged animals, it's a little bit harder in vitro to cause differentiation in the to new cell lines because you, you have to provide more stimulus in an older stem cell than in a younger stem cell. So the use of amniotic material not only gives us a large volume of cells, but they're very robust, rapidly proliferating. Um, amnion's been shown to be much faster at proliferating uh, cells than, than bone marrow uh, and they, they differentiate a lot easier you know so it, it helps with that tissue heal when they can differentiate so the cellular component from amnion medicinal signaling cell is another term that you may occasionally run <laughs> Medicinal signaling cell it may be another term that you run across. 
uh, every once in a while, uh, very commonly, for the most part, you're going to see mesenchymal stem cell. Uh, again, these are pluripotent uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Some other cells that are in the material, there's some fibroblasts, keratinocytes, but upwards of 40% of the cells in amniotic fluid are mesenchymal stem cells. So it's a huge population of cells that, that are, uh, and because of that, we do not have to culture expand to them. How many of you guys have ever done bone marrow derived or fat derived stem cells? Is anybody? Now I see somebody's head nodding. I see Dr. Partridge on my screen. I saw your head nod. Um, one of the things that I always found a, as a flaw in bone marrow derived stem cells, I had success with them, don't get me wrong, but it was the delay that I had to go through. After I collected bone marrow, I had to send it to a lab. It was usually about three and a half to four weeks before I got my sample back. Because Amnion has such a high concentration of cells, we can actually isolate those cells in the lab during the processing and, and pre-package them so that they're ready to go. We don't have to culture expand these cells. So it saves a step for the veterinarian and allows us to treat injuries before they get to the more chronic stage where you tend to have more fibrosis, less vascularity, that kind of thing going on. The other thing that it means is that we don't have to do a lot of the, uh, the tissue culture processing where you're using a lot of things like collagenases and, and other enzymes. Uh, and there's been some work that has shown tissue culture fluid tends to contain fetal bovine serum. And if you don't get all of that out, it can, be, uh, it can cause an inflammatory reaction. And it can also alter the cells to some degree, their functionality. Uh, it's not totally known how much, or, or from a clinical standpoint, how much of a problem that is. You know, but with Amnion, you don't have to worry about those things uh, because we don't have to do the tissue culture. When we look at the Amnion itself, okay, so here, here's the fluid up here the uh, epithelium here, which all of our acellular products that's denuded because we've removed the cells. But what becomes important is when you look at the actual amnion is the amount of material that's in it. You've got various forms of collagen, which the nice thing about that is when we talk about treating joints versus tendons, we have the appropriate collagen types present to treat both sites. It's already there. Fibronectin, laminin, those things help with anti-adhesion properties. So for me as a, as a large animal vet, when I'm treating uh, a flexor tendon, flexor tendons that adhere together in a horse can pretty much ruin a performance career. You know, so the, the ability to reduce adhesion formation uh, as I'm treating tissues, that kind of thing, uh, becomes extremely important. Uh, and, and Amnion naturally has that in it already. I always debate whether or not to, to use this particular slide. I, I'm never a fan of, of these kind of charts. Uh, because it makes everything look black and white. Uh, and, and you always only have one column that has all the checks in it. Uh, ultimately, what, what I want you to, to think about it, as you look at this is, number one, there's a lot of sources of regenerative therapies. Each of them have their place. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't think that there is one thing out there that is the ultimate panacea that, that fixes everything. You'll have treatment failures in any type of therapy that you do. Uh, I always kind of use the joke, I only have one drug in, in my cabinet that has never failed me, and that's euthanasia solution. I may have to give more, but it's never failed. 
But ultimately, when we look at this, one of the things that's nice about amniotic material, especially the product that we have, number one, it is an off-the-shelf product. Uh, most of our products, depending on the severity of the wound, it's a one-and-done treatment. You treat these animals one time, the wound heals. That's it. It's not a every week you have to do an injection, every two weeks, you know, things like that. Uh, the use, the ease of use, there's no special equipment required. We already have needles and syringes. You don't need to process anything. All of that's taken care of. Admittedly, it doesn't take very long to, to process PRP. Like the kit I was using took me about 25 minutes, and that's it. The other nice thing is this is something for large animal vets. You can carry it on your truck. Uh, so it, it is readily available to you. So you can treat same day as diagnosis, easy to use. We're going to talk a little bit about the science. So I've kind of talked a little bit, kind of introducing the idea of amnion uh, to you guys. But I, I want to show you the science. And, and, and I love this study. Uh, because I'm a surgeon and, and I like to cut stuff and stitch it back together. And this was kind of a cool study. But this was a study done at, at, uh, by Stanford. Uh, and it, it shows, it starts to elucidate how amnion works and why it works. And it's, it's because of this stromal-derived factor one. Well, what they did is they took two groups of wild-type mice, just like all good research projects do. You have to play with mice. They actually took one of the groups and dyed their uh, bone marrow mesenchymal cells with a green fluorescent dye. And they left the other one as undyed mice. So we've got a green group and a white group. They took the white group, Animations are a little slow. And they actually implanted amniotic material, amniotic. another acellular inert material, and then a sham operated site. Okay, so you got amnion, inert acellular material, and sham operated. And this is where things got a little cool. They actually took the two mice. Let's see if we can run through this animation just a little bit faster. And they really did connect them. They actually connected the circulatory systems between these two mice so that the circulatory system of the green mice communicated with the white mice. Okay. Then what they did is they harvested the mice. And what they found was a statistically significant increase in the number of mesenchymal stem cells from the green mice at the site of the amnion. When they tested the tissue, what they found was a much higher level of stromal derived. Did I, did I see a question? Oh, my husband's they found a statistically higher level of stromal derived factor one at the site of the amniotic material. And what they figured out is yes, SDF1 plays a role in recruiting cells. It's a cell signaling molecule. So it recruits cells to the site of tissue damage to help heal it. What the amnion does is significantly upregulate the production of SDF1 so that you get a stronger recruitment of these cells into the area to heal the tissue. And, and that was an acellular amniotic material. So just the material itself has the ability to, to markedly increase the body's own repair mechanism in comparison to another bio-scaffold. So I thought that that was, was extremely interesting. The way that it works, the way that, that uh, the cellular component of the amnion, so that's the acellular that works with SDF. The cellular component of amnion, the mesenchymal stem cells, what we've learned about those is 
Everybody, rem- do you guys remember alpha granules from platelets, the, the little bags of growth factors in platelets? Well, they were called alpha granules. In stem cells, they're called secretomes, okay? And they contain these exosomes, which contain microRNA. The purpose of microRNA, and this is the analogy I always use, if there's 25 of us on this call right now, let's say three of us are stem cells. Our job is not to replace the other 22 people. Our job as a stem cell is actually to heal the other 22 cells so that they can do their job, okay? That's the purpose of microRNA. They're delivered through the secretomes and exosomes, and their job is to heal or repair cellular function in damaged tissue cells. Essentially, that's what it looks like here. Okay, so this is the stem cell up here. These are the big secretomes releasing these little exosomes, which contain the microRNA. They migrate to the target cell. They're incorporated into that target cell, and then, they, then the microRNA is released so that it can repair the internal structure of that damaged cell so that it can return to normal cellular physiology and continue its job. And, and this is really the basis of how stem cells work. That's true of all stem cells, not just amniotic stem cells. So some other things uh, about amniotic stem cells that, that's been shown, again, uh, because of that increase in SDF1, they are excellent at stimulating cell migration and proliferation. They contain and drive and increase a variety of growth factors. See, there's SDF1 there. Okay. They've also been shown to increase or upregulate the production of anti-fibrotic materials such as TGF beta-3, uh, HGF, VEGF, uh, but they also regulate the MMPs and TEMPs, which stimulate or run the process of inflammation. So there is a bit of an anti-inflammatory component to amniotic material. Uh, if anybody out there is involved with like USCF or FEI level horses. This is not a pain reliever. It's a cellular anti-inflammatory. It's not an anti-inflammatory like bute, banamine, prevacox, any of those. Okay. I think we're all probably familiar with the inflammatory cascade. All of these components, IRAP, that's a big popular one in, in regenerative therapy. The IRAP protein is contained within amnion, just like it's contained everywhere. Okay. IL-6 and IL-10 are both anti-inflammatory interleukins, both of which are in high concentrations in amnion. So amnion uh, brings to the table all of these anti-inflammatory, uh, angiogenic, uh, anti uh, fibrotic uh, type molecules that, that modulate all aspects of the inflammatory cascade from hemostasis to remodeling. So it, it affects all levels of the healing cascade of tissue. This was actually a study that, that we had done, uh, that, that Anacel had done by Dr. Lauren Schnabel, large animal surgeon at NC State. And what they did is they took our product and looked at superficial wounds in horses. Okay, and EAM, StemRap is one of our products. It's a topical membrane, uh, comes in in a five centimeter by five centimeter uh, sheet, a 10 by 10 and a 10 by 16. Okay. And then StemRap Plus is the injectable version of this membrane. So they had standard uh, wound care treatments, lavage, debridement, bandaging, and then they treated 11 horses with, with Anacel product. And they looked at overall wound areas, wound contracture rates, 
and uh, daily wound contracture. Okay. Adverse reactions, none. Uh, so that, that's always a good thing. Daily wound contracture, much higher contracture rates hey. of wounds that were treated with amniotic material uh, than standard of care, uh, highly statistically significant. Wound closure ratios, uh, at 20 days, the wound closed 47% faster just by treating with amniotic material. And the stem wrap product is an acellular product. So this is the effect of just the material without even cells present. At 60 days, the wound had contracted 84% versus 41% on the, the controls. Now, if you see here on this graph, you notice the, the controls, it's a very linear progression in the wound versus the amniotic material really kind of caps out and starts to, to kind of plateau out. It's because what happens is the body utilizes that material. Once it's, it's like building a house, once you run out of raw material, it's not doing anything anymore because it's been used. But if you notice, you really don't hit that plateau for about 45 to 50 days before you're really getting into that plateau. So one treatment is affecting the wound physiology and healing functionalities of that tissue for that long. One of the neat things that, that nobody really expected, but Dr. Schnabel did find out, is actually older wounds, and, and they set the, the differentiation at three weeks. So anything less than three weeks versus things older than three weeks. Uh, actually, older wounds did heal faster than fresh wounds. That said, you, you can see the wound closure rates here. Fresh wounds okay. just fine, uh, but it, it was statistically significant. Okay, so these are the older wounds. These are the, the more recent, more acute wounds here. Okay. So that was a pretty interesting finding that even in these chronic wounds, where we think of them being more fibrotic and less responsive without aggressive debridement, that kind of thing, uh, they, they respond very well to amniotic material. So conclusions, what we just talked about, uh, the closure rates are, are markedly increased along with the contraction. Of course, contraction is just shrinkage of the wound. Closure is re-epithelialization. Uh, and the chronic wounds actually did closed faster uh, than, than the younger wounds. 2016 to 2017, uh, that, that year we had about 1,200 total treatments uh, of various kinds with an 84% efficacy rate, zero infections. I've talked to a few vets that, that have asked me about potential for neoplastic formations in wounds when treated. Uh, it's something that has been commented on with adipose-derived stem cells, not so much the bone marrow-derived, uh, you know, but anecdotally talked about with adipose in both in veterinary literature and in human literature that has never once been reported that amnion has caused a neoplastic transformation. Okay, so nothing to worry about there. Another study that we had done that's here uh, was done at the University of Chihuahua in Mexico. They actually took rams and drilled osteotomy holes through the tibial tuberosity and looked at amniotic materials effect on bone growth. One of the things that is important is, and this would be important in the case of like fracture repair, things like that, is that yes, amniotic material has an absolutely statistically significant improvement in uh, bone growth, but it is normal bone growth. It is not hyperplastic, it is not overzealous, it is like a, it is a faster callus formation from any bone injury. It's not an overzealous, it's highly controlled. Uh, 
because there, there are also some bone stimulatory proteins uh, present in amnion. This little graph here kind of shows the, the classic profile of response to treatment. We really see about four different responses and, and it'll vary from case to case. There was a question earlier about a proximal suspensory desmitis. Um, not all proximal suspensory desmitises will respond exactly the same. They can fall into any of these four categories. About 20 to 25 percent of the time, we'll see a very rapid improvement in the patient within a day or two. They're much more comfortable in their, their gait. Their gait deficit is eliminated. Uh, most of them will fall into this orange group where it's a very steady uh, over three to four weeks improvement in lameness. Uh, you'll have some non-responders down here. And then a term that I learned after seeing this graph was, you can't see the bottom side of the, the gray group, but is a hockey stick profile. We're at about week, anywhere of three to four, the horse is just, the patient's just doing okay not really getting a lot better, and then suddenly gets a lot better, uh, very dramatically. And, and that's that hockey stick profile. Uh, so we see a variety of those. Most of them, is, it's a gradual increase over about three to four weeks. The reactions that we see, quote unquote reactions, some minor swelling, a little bit of stiffness. Uh, I just talked to a vet today in Florida that treated her own personal horse. 24 hours after injection, uh, had a moderate increase in swelling over the flexor tendons. She asked me if she needed to do anything about it. No, there's no need to treat any of that. Uh, in the event of stiffness, some gait deficits, we actually encourage the animal to be moved. Get them out, get them moving around, and essentially what there is is there's some tissue edema, uh, you get them moving and it goes away. The other thing that, that we do like to talk about, the way that Amnion works driving some neovascularization, we do highly recommend the, the use of, of various other therapies in conjunction with it to help drive increase in cellular metabolism, uh, neovascularization, that kind of thing. The thing that I use the most is extracorporeal shockwave. Uh, that said, radio pulse therapy, uh, laser therapy, uh, things like needling or, or coblation, um, anything to get that tissue going. We all probably remember Wolf's Law, tissue will heal based on the forces applied to it. You know, one of the things about amnion is these animals don't just go on strict rest. It's not cage rest, it's not stall rest. They need to be actively rehabilitated. It increases the efficacy and the, and the healing profile of the tissue. So these animals need to be out doing something. That doesn't mean that you treat and then send your horse to run the Kentucky Derby. That's overly aggressive rehab. It still needs to be controlled, but the animals need to be doing something. Okay, Some things that we recommend you don't do, you, you really don't want to, if you're treating tendon ligament injuries, joint injuries, things like that, you don't want to immobilize them. Okay, Because then that tissue is not working the way that it should. So it's not going to heal as well as it should. We don't ice these areas because that reduces blood flow to the area and we want the blood flow. Inside our bodies, there, there's an excellent source of mesenchymal stem cells. We probably all learned about them during histopath and subsequently forgot them after the test. They're called pericytes. They're a cell that lives on the outer wall of the blood vessels. They are a mesenchymal stem cell. So when we generate neovascularization into an area, not only are we bringing nutrients, 
uh, and white birch pits and white birch pits were brand new repair sites to help heal the tissue. So you don't want to reduce that. Anti-inflammatories, um, I always say it depends on the case that you're using. We want to minimize them, but it depends on the case. Me personally, when I treat a bowed tendon or a, a, a suspensory that, that's injured, if that horse is too uncomfortable, it makes the rehab much harder. They're not going to do it, and they're not going to be willing to load those tissues the way that I need them to. So I'll use minimal amounts of anti-inflammatories if I have to. If I can, I would prefer an opioid-based product like tramadol, um, you know, but in the horse, that's a little harder to use. Um, because it doesn't last as long. So I end up using butanbanamine. Now, some of the, the idea of no anti-inflammatory is also extrapolated from human medicine. That said, there's some recent human research out that shows it was done on corneal healing with amniotic material. That amnion, when combined with corticosteroids, actually had a better healing profile, more clarity, less fibrosis to the cornea than amnion alone. So I think that in the future, what we may see is some of these recommendations change as the science progresses, and we see that there's no adverse reactions, no faults in it. But right now, we still recommend minimizing true NSAID, uh, usage in these patients as much as possible. Again, here's the, the anti-inflammation or the, the inflammation cascade, just to reiterate uh, that, that the amnion works on all stages of the inflammatory cascade to, to improve the overall tissue heal. This is a, a slide that I leave in here uh, because I, I think it's another way to, to think about the product. For us as veterinarians, the ability to treat, especially for an ambulatory practitioner, the ability to treat at the time of, of diagnosis without having to, to wait four weeks for cells to be cultured or to go back to your clinic to spin down the PRP, uh, things like that you can treat on site. So your efficiency in treating is increased for the owners, but the concept of almost one and done treatment. Yes, that treatment may be more expensive than routine bandaging, but it's one and done and you get a faster heal. It's better for the patient because they heal faster and they feel heal better. And I'll show you a study that, that backs that up. Not that you guys are distributors, uh, but for them it's nice because it's a shippable product. All right, we're gonna look at wounds. I'm sorry, I know a lot of you guys are small animal folks. Most of these pictures are horses because I'm a horse guy. Uh, so <laughs> that's where I get a, get a lot of pictures. These pictures, however, were actually from Dr. Schnabel's study. Um, this was a horse that the original injury was on June 1st. You can see it wasn't treated for almost two and a half months. Okay, 74 days after, after injury. Got a large degloving type injury on the front side of a hock. Uh, lots of granulation tissue, but we've got a large cleft in that granulation tissue right over the joint. You know, so from a, a practitioner standpoint, especially horses, you know, you have to be very concerned about the potential for septic arthritis, uh, which, which can be extremely lethal in the horse. Treatment day here. Six days later, you can see the amount of wound contracture already. The other thing that is impressive in this wound is that the granulation tissue is actually receding back. Proud flesh is something we deal with a lot in horses, uh, and it's kind of a hemorrhoid. It's a bit of a pain in the rear end. Uh, but treatment with amniotic material, I routinely will see some degree of proud flesh in my patients, 
but most of the time I will leave it alone and then it will actually recede back on its own. At day nine, you can see even better the amount of wound contracture. That central cleft over the joint is completely granulated in, and we've got an excellent rim of epithelial tissue growing across it. Okay, and, and the fact that it has now protected that joint with one treatment is extremely beneficial, not only to us as veterinarians because our case doesn't get worse, but it's beneficial to the patient and to the owner. Um, for the owner, it saves money in the long run. Day 46, here's that wound again, a little bit lower resolution image, uh, but you can see how rapidly this wound is progressing. And I think that this is a phenomenal wound to use as an example, because it's a high motion area, and it's a hard area to get healed in the horse. So that, that wound progressed extremely well in only 46 days. A lot of these kind of wounds, of course, this wound here was actually 74 days in age when Dr. Schnabel first treated it. It's not uncommon for one of these wounds to take four to five months to heal in the equine world. Another horse wound, nice deep leg laceration, uh, right on the front side of the hock, clean down to the bone, treated on day zero. Five days later, completely granulated over. Yes, the wound looks bigger, uh, so it has not very well contracted yet. But by day nine, extremely healthy bed of granulation tissue. You can already see the epithelial tissue forming across here. Conventional bandaging techniques. Uh, a horse with a wound like this, I would expect it to be probably three weeks to four weeks before you ever came close to this level of granulation tissue uh, in the wound. By two weeks, you can see the amount of contracture, especially from day nine to day 14. One of the things that, that we, we do like to comment on is not only does the wound heal contract and epithelialize very rapidly, but we do get hair growth back very quickly. So when I'm dealing with a show horse, that's very important because you have a better cosmetic outcome in these wounds, uh, that, that we get this hair growth back as quickly as we do. Uh, so that's the wound at two weeks out. Again, this is the kind of wound that will usually take you three to four months to get healed uh, in the horse world. More leg wounds, we deal with those a lot. Uh, this is more of a, almost a burn type wound on the inside of a hock, jump all the way up here to day 16. From day zero to day 16, you can see the very nice healthy bed of granulation tissue, but also the overall wound contraction from the top side of the wound to here. Excellent wound contracture. By four weeks in, the wound is almost done healing. And that's, that's a single treatment on all of these cases. This is something that, that as a horse vet, you always hate to see come in. Not only do you have a, which facial wounds tend to heal very well. Um, this horse has punched a hole all the way into its uh, maxillary sinus. So you've got an extensive bone injury on top of it. They were able, I did not treat this case, uh, another veterinarian sent us these pictures, um, but after 42 days, they were able to salvage a little bit of the skin flap here to sew it over. You can see the difference in where the skin flap was and where the skin flap was not, uh, but you've got excellent healing across this wound by day 100, and I'm sorry, the photos of everybody, day 108, Everybody's photos are covering my, part of my slide. By day 108, uh, not only is the external portion of the wound healed, but actually what's really important about this case is the bone itself did heal. Okay, so it completely closed over this large hole into the maxillary sinus. That became important because one of the things that I love to do outside of the OR is equine dentistry. 
we deal with fistulas after uh, certain dental procedures or, or have the potential to deal with them. And I have found that the amniotic material is a fantastic way to treat fistulas uh, because it stimulates the healing process of not only the soft tissue, but also the bone. So it's a fantastic way to heal fistulas. A couple of eye cases, we, we do have a, an ocular line. Uh, this is an ocular patch here. And, and we have the equus cell here, which is the equine line. There is a canis cell also uh, for the, the small animal line. But inside this little green blister pack, this, this particular one is 15 millimeters in diameter, but it's a small ocular patch for treating corneal injuries. There's also a liqui liquefied version of it to be used as drops, can be given through SPLs, things like that. I find in the horse world uh, that the, the anaocular or, or corneal patch uh, is really about all that I need. This is a 25-year-old pony um, that was treated actually in Pennsylvania. You can see the large desmetaceal right here in the eye and I'm gonna have to move everybody's picture real quick. You can see it there prior to treatment. In the horse world, these things are terrifying because this is a great way to lose an eye. Uh, the vast majority of these cases, if you're gonna treat them, they're going to have to have a conjunctival flap uh, with an SPL placed. Okay, five days after treatment, I'm gonna try and zoom in here just a little bit. This horse was actually treated with just a patch, no SPL, no antibiotics, just a patch. And you can see there's the original edge of the desmetaceal, and you can see how much corneal healing occurred in just five days. At 20 days post-treatment, it's nearly completely granulated over. By 26 days, it was completely granulated over. The eye stayed intact. And what's been shown with amniotic material in corneal healing is actually a reduced corneal scarring in comparison to other treatments. And that's conjunctival flaps or older products like the old A cell. We have a much better healing profile because of those anti fibrotic factors present in the amnion. There's another really pretty eye. Uh, this is a complete corneal laceration. My pointer went away. Keeps running away. But you can see the corneal laceration with iris prolapse. Ten days later, the amount of, of contracture of that wound and healing of the cornea. The other thing that's very important is look at how clear the cornea itself is. So this horse is not going to end up with any type of visual field deficit from corneal scarring. Now you can see the sites in the eyelids. This horse did have a tarsorophy put in, which we do recommend for a couple of reasons. Number one, the corneal patch does not require suturing to the eye. It's placed on it. It sticks relatively well by hydrostatic tension, just like a human contact. So it's very easy to apply, but it will move around some, especially as they blink. So putting the tarsorophy in helps hold that patch in there. The other thing that, that we have learned from some preliminary data that the University of Florida has done for us on corneal healing is they looked at corneal temperatures in healing. They looked at 37 degrees Celsius and 34 degrees Celsius. What they found is at 37 degrees, the cornea healed faster than at 37 or 34. So by putting the tarsorophy in, we reduce the cornea's exposure to ambient air, which cools the surface of the cornea. We keep it warmer and it will heal faster. Uh, so that those are the two big reasons that we recommend the tarsorophy. You only have to leave those in for four, maybe five days. 
by then the product has broken down, the body has absorbed it and it's utilizing it. In the interim, while the tarsorophy is in, you may see a little bit uh, of discharge, uh, kind of a mucopurulent to slightly yellow discharge around your tarsorophy. That is the body breaking the material down. You do not need to take the tarsorophy out and treat. Leave it alone, let the tarsorophy stay in for four to five days, and then take that. This is some work, uh, an excellent study that was done looking at bone marrow derived versus amniotic derived mesenchymal stem cells. This is a study done in horses. You can see the, the different uh, performances of, of the horses show jumping, dressage, eventing. What they looked at were tendon and ligament injuries. And, and this is where I want to go back to the question earlier for anybody that heard it about a proximal suspensory injury. Okay. They looked at, at both tendon and ligament injuries. They correlated severity of injury and performance of the horse. The difference in treatment was bone marrow derived versus amniotic mesenchymal derived stem cells. Okay. What they found is that the amniotic mesenchymal treated horses healed faster and better. And the way that they showed that they healed better is the re injury rate for bone marrow derived treated horses, the horse treated with bone marrow stem cells, the re injury rate was 20% on those damaged tissues. Re-injury rate on amniotic mesenchymal stem cell treated horses, 2%. So a marked improvement in the healing of these tissues with amniotic versus bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells to reduce the, the re-injury rate from 20% to 2%. This is a case that, that we treated as Anacel. This is a complete tear of a flexor tendon in a horse, which traditionally as a practitioner, when I see one of these cases, one of the first things that, that I tell an owner is you better be extremely patient. This is a year long injury. This is going to take your horse a year to rehab. And we won't know the ultimate outcome for a year. And there's, high risks of, of re-injury. This horse is a completely torn superficial digital flexor tendon. Let's zoom back in here just a little bit for you guys. You can see on the ultrasound, the tear through the tendon here. Let's scoot some pictures over. Transverse imaging. At day 69, this is the longitudinal image in the transverse. Yes, we still have a core lesion in here. Uh, but markedly improved. The important thing about this horse is at day 69, one of these horses, I would traditionally tell an owner, expect to keep them in a stall with no hand walking for a minimum of four months, and then we'll, we'll consider whether or not to let you even walk them out of the stall. This horse at day 69 was back in, in low level exercise. So not only was it just being hand walked, but it was actually out being exercised. So a marked improvement in not only the speed, but the quality of healing when treating with amniotic material. I used to tell folks all the time, regenerative therapies improve the quality, they do not improve the speed. Amnion has proved me wrong on that in that it truly improves the quality and the speed of healing. Shrink back down here. And just for the, the small animal folks, we do have one small animal case. For anybody in here that's a horse person, this dog got stepped on by a horse. So it appeases both crowds. Skin, skin wound on the, the, the paw with fracture. Uh, not sure if it was a front leg or a back leg. I didn't treat the case, uh, obviously, because I'm a large animal guy. Uh, but a fracture of either a metatarsal or metacarpal bone. 22 days post-treatment, this, this dog was treated with the injectable product. 
my mouse keeps disappearing. You can see the two small pimples on the, the, the foot where the injections were done at 22 days. It's not just granulated, but it's completely re-epithelialized. Uh, the dog was not immobilized in that foot. And you can see it's not great, but there's fair realignment of the bone and a really nice callus formation starting uh, with very minimal immobilization. Again, we want these animals to be able to use the tissue. I think this is also an excellent example of if you had multiple fractures in here, there's no way that I would feel right telling you guys, don't, you, you can't immobilize this. You still have to treat the patient, okay? But we do want them to apply some forces to that tissue so that it heals in a better way than, than strict immobilization and cage rest. There's a little bit of, of kind of forethinking. These are a couple of PubMed searches that I did this morning. You can see my search terms at the, at the top, amnion and lung and amnion stroke. And you can see what the human folks are, are doing with this material. They're actually looking at treating lung injury, acute brain injury, neurologic type problems. I think this is the future of amniotic material in veterinary medicine that we can treat other things. As a company, Anacel, uh, it's only been, I think, a couple of weeks now uh, that a practitioner treated a dog with heart disease. I don't know a lot of the details about it, uh, but a, a heart patient. We've treated a couple of renal failure patients. We don't have a lot to give you a great, uh, a lot of high level scientific numbers, anything like that. What we found is in those, the, the renal failure patients, we treat them once a year. So there, there's still retreatment that's not a one and done treatment, but we're improving the quality of life in these animals with one treatment for a year, uh, bringing BUN and creatinine down, but they do have to be retreated. But I thought that these were very interesting because it gives us an idea of where this is going, where amniotic material is going, and, and the, the overall potential that it has treating lung disease, uh, acute inflammatory response, uh, things like that. So it, it's extremely fascinating. And that's what I've got for you guys, and I would like to open it up. First, I'd like to say... If anybody has questions, things like that, you think of something later, there's my email, uh, there's my cell phone number. You can always feel free to contact me. More than happy to talk with you guys about cases. But I'd kind of like to open things up. If you've got a case you would like to talk about right now or, or just have questions on the, the material and products in general. I know somebody's got a question. Okay. I was just going to ask you if the amniotic fluid is species specific. Is amniotic fluid species specific? What for I'm not what sure used for treatment? Do what? What used for treatment? You know, like dog amnion, I am now to dog amnion. No, it is not. One of the reasons it's not, actually the first case I ever saw treated uh, was a cat. Uh, now, it was a very large cat, since I'm a large animal guy. It was a Bengal tiger uh, and had chronic corneal ulcerations for about four years. Uh, you know, the, the benefit to amniotic material, because it's an immune privileged tissue, not just the tissue itself, but the fluid also, it's an immune privileged site. So you, you can use it not only allogeneically, but xenogeneically without inflammatory reactions. Uh, there's some work, I just saw a really neat study done 
uh, using amniotic stem cells to treat colitis in rats. They induced colitis in rats as a model, and they used human amniotic stem cells, which would, there would be a component of the fluid used to, to dilute them out. But because it's an immune privilege site, and when you talk about the cellular product, which is called Animotion uh, from Anacel, our Animotion product, because they're MHC class two negative, you do not get those immune reactions when you cross species line. The two species we collect from are dogs during C-section and mares during foaling. We fold them out at the CEO's farm in Chandler and collect during parturition, both the material and the fluid. Uh, we still treat, I don't talk about it a whole lot, but we have treated a few food animals. And it's a whole different ball game because of the FDA. Uh, but we've also treated cats thus far. Uh, but you can cross species line without a concern. Hey, Dr. Sissel, Dr. Miriam uh, had a question. What is the shelf life of these products? Shelf life of the product, what we know right now is two years. Uh, so the products are, are viable for two years. And I say it that way because product viability hasn't been looked at for longer than that. Yeah, there it is. Now it just showed up on the screen. Two years. <laughs> but excellent question. What else? I know there's more questions. And there's still writing happening on the screen. Oh, now it's being erased. Come on, I know you guys have got more questions. Did I answer the question on suspensory ligament? Okay. I don't remember who asked. Yes. But okay. I had a question about my golden retriever. If she's got elbow dysplasia, treat her sub Q every six months or once a year? Part of it's going to depend on the, the severity of the arthritis that is set in. Okay. Obviously, when, when we're talking uh, about a disease process, especially things like osteoarthritis. If you have one that, that you catch the case early on where you have minimal cartilage degradation and subchondral bone change, you're, you're gonna end up treating them less frequently than the one that has massive cartilage degradation, large osteophytes, lots of, of already set in joint things like that. You may be treating them a little earlier. I would, most of the cases that we're treating, even more severe bad stifles in, in dogs, bad hops, are still being treated on an annual basis, not every six months. Uh, so depending on the case, and that's where there's, there's not a dog or a horse in this conversation listening to us. They're not listening to what I'm telling you guys. Okay, you, you're gonna have some cases that you might treat in eight months or 10 months, okay? Most of them, most cases, when, when I do follow up for the company, uh, when, when Brandon does follow up for the company, what we're finding is most cases are being treated once a year. And that's, that question actually brought up a, a point that, that I do want to reiterate, again, the treatment with the product when you're talking about a joint or a tendon or a ligament, you're not injecting the joint. You're not injecting the tendon or the ligament. You're injecting next to it, which goes back to the idea of user friendliness. If you want to inject, if you want to treat carpal arthritis, you don't inject the carpus. It's a periarticular or sub-Q injection on the outside of the joint capsule, because of that stromal derived factor one, it attracts that material to the site of tissue damage. Then the material upregulates stromal derived factor one and draws a larger increase in, in healing factors and cells from the body. So you don't inject intrasynovial or into a tendon or a ligament. 
so much easier to administer. A uh, question was asked, how do you procure these products? How, how, do, <laughs> how do we procure them? From the horse, we catch the baby as it's coming out. Uh, the, the dog amniotic material, fluid, and the amnion is collected during scheduled C-sections. These are client-owned animals. On the dog side, we work with local veterinarians. We come in during a scheduled C-section and collect material. On the horse side, we actually have owners that, that are breeding their, their horses for other reasons, ranch horses, or, or just because they want to breed. If we bring the horses to the farm. They're under video surveillance. Um, so that when they go into labor, we can be present to sterilely collect the material uh, during the birthing process. Okay. Um, uh, as far as uh, if they've got more information that they're looking for, where would they go to find that? Absolutely. <laughs> we. The company has a website, anacellbiotech.com, and I would encourage all of you guys to, to go to the website. When you get there, what you're gonna find is we have a firewall that, that's built, because as a company, we only market to veterinarians. We do not market to the owners, just to the veterinarians. So we have a firewall on the website called Vet Access. You need to sign up for that. Okay. And you sign up for vet access. We give you the, the access. Then you can log in. And behind that, there's a couple of videos. Right now, they're, they're on horses. Um, in the future, we'd like to have some dog treatment videos also. But there's also more information about the product. There, there's a list of product names. Again, we have one cellular product in motion, then the rest of our products are all acellular. Uh, the products stem wrap, that's the superficial sheet for external wounds. There's stem wrap D, which is the reconstitutable powder form of stem wrap. Stem wrap plus is the old fluid form uh, that was already reconstituted for you. That one does have to stay frozen. Then we also have an ocular line, uh, an ocular. We have a, a product called Animatrix, which is for tendons and ligaments, things like that, internal tissue damage. And we also have a, a group of products called BioScaf, uh, which are strips that are used for surgical implantation. Uh, you know, if I'm doing a colic surgery on a horse, I can use one of those graphs once I close the linea and lay it in there, close right over it, uh, and reduce the chances of things like incisional infections uh, and, and improve the quality of tissue healing, reduce the overall scar formation post-op. So you'll find all that stuff uh, once you log into the vet access. And again, that's anacellbiotech.com. What else? What else do you guys have? Where can they get a copy of this presentation? <laughs> where, where can they get a copy of this presentation? We are currently recording the presentation. So if anybody would like a copy, uh, again, there's my email. Email me and I think Carol Williams with the ACVMA wants to uh, archive this so that you can go back and watch it again. So I'll either be able to get it to you or we'll get it over to Carol Williams at ACVMA and she'll be able to get it to you. Either one. Uh, 
Um, if anyone, uh, if you haven't sent me your uh, name and email address, please just uh, just use the chat to send that to me or, uh, so that we can make sure that we get everybody their CE credits. Um, if you're an AZVMA member, it's $5 for your CE credit, $10 if you're a non-member. I did just have another question through the chat, uh, which probably everybody saw it pop up. Uh, is it easy to set up an account with the company? Absolutely. When you register with Vet Access, essentially that's what you're doing is setting the account up. You can also, in the future, you can actually order the product through Vet Access. If you have questions though, what I would encourage you to do is, is contact one of us. I mean, like I said, there, there's my email address there. You can always contact me and I can help you figure out which product might be best for you uh, if you have questions about which one to use. But you can order through Vet Access also. Uh, so once, once you register with that, uh, part of the registration process is phone number and address and, and all of that kind of stuff. But that sets the account up with the company. So very easy to do. It'll take you a couple of minutes online and that's it. Dr. Roy already set it up and I'm improving him now. <laughs> Brandon takes care of all of our approvals. So if everybody jumps on right now and sets it up, Brandon will get you taken care of right now. Do we have any other questions? Nope. Getting a. Let's see. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I hope everybody learned a little something. Uh, and and for me, I think one of the most important parts about CE is if you can get one thing out of it uh, that, that helps your practice, then. It, then it's a, a valuable CE. I hope that you guys got a little something out of this. I want to appreciate, or, or I want to just say thank you for, for participating tonight. Um, and please, seriously, I've got this thing with me all the time. Feel free to call me, email me, what, whatever. I'm happy to talk about cases with you guys. Let's see, oh, here's one. Has any work been done on using the product for high ring bone to fuse a joint? No. Um, and actually, the way that, that the amnion works, I don't think that it would help with fusion because it's going to try to heal the tissue as normal as possible. Uh, for any small animal folks, just to, to clarify, if you if you are familiar with the term ring bone, it's osteoarthritis of the pastern joint in a horse. Uh, well, high ring bone is. Um, a lot of times when, when we treat those with fusion, it's surgical fusion and arthrodesis. Um, that's actually a situation where, as a surgeon, I would, unless I'm doing a surgical fusion. I wouldn't recommend, uh, if you're gunning for fusion, I wouldn't recommend the amnion because it's gonna try to heal the tissue. The amniotic material is going to try to heal the tissue to a normal state instead of fusing the joint. Now, if you were to, to go in surgically, it's going to increase the bone healing and the bone bridge across there. So in that standpoint, would I use amnion? Yes but not to just treat it. If you're after fusion, that said, can it make the horse more comfortable by delaying or, or reducing the damage, counteracting the damage from the osteoarthritis? Yes. So if you're not after fusion, you could use it. But if you're really gunning for fusion of that joint, I, I would not recommend amnion because I think it's actually gonna slow that process of fusion. Does that make sense? I hope so. <laughs> 
Dr. Sissel, thank you for uh, for uh, taking a little bit of your evening tonight and uh, spending it with these nice folks. Um, again, if there's any questions, uh, uh, Dr. Sissel's email's there. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to have you on board, Dr. Sissel, because typically it was my email. So thanks a bunch. Uh, small animal people and sell products uh, have been so helpful for a DJ, 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 D and OA cases. Um, we have done significant work with uh, uh, age related osteoarthritis and aged dogs um, have spent uh, uh, what, what, uh, what is really valuable there is the fact that we don't have to harvest stem cells and put the animal under anesthesia in which to, to do that harvest. And so we're able to treat same day as diagnosis with a stem cell related product um, for significantly less than uh, other cellular related therapies. And so thank you, Dr. Girardi. Uh, um, we would expect by the end of the year to have a uh, osteoarthritis study completed in uh, small animals. Uh, treating uh, age-related OA. And so uh, if you've got any questions in regards to that, um, don't hesitate to reach out. All right, let's let these people go have dinner. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys again for, for participating, taking some of your evening out. Uh, like I said, contact me if you have any questions. And if, uh, final thing, if uh, you'd like to have us by your practice, um, Dr. Sissel's more than happy to travel, so <laughs> we can come by and speak to your vets. Thank you very much. Be -Y, not B-U-Y. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good evening. <laughs>